You're listening to Mornings with Gary Byron, the Republican voice of reason, only on the Talk of Connecticut Radio Network. You know, if there was a word of the day, I think the word for today would be uh, momentum. Well, you, we're talking about the baseball playoffs. You know, the Yankees are just playing one game after another after another. And they went from the ALDS to the ALCS. To, the Astros haven't played a game in you know a while. Not that uh, you never listen, you never, never count them out. But Yankees they got a lot of momentum, as does the Republican Party right now. There is a lot of momentum. I, I really, I don't even think we had this momentum. I don't know, three weeks ago, two weeks, maybe, two, uh, maybe the last couple of weeks we have. Um, but it's all about peak. You know, you want to peak at the right time. And there's well, what, what three weeks left till election day. This is really, I mean, you want to go into these last final three weeks leading up to Election Day with that momentum. I don't know if you're feeling it. I am. I don't know if you're sensing a shift, but I am. Are you ready for a change? Well, I am. Good morning. It is uh, Gary Byron, nine eleven here on this uh, hump day. Uh, our next guest into the Daily Connerton Memorial Company interview chair is not only one of my favorite guests. He's one of I know one of your favorite guests. I would say that he represents uh, the people in Southington, Water. Barry Prospect. Is it Cheshire too? I think. I don't know. I think it's Cheshire. Yeah. Um, but you know what? The truth of the matter is, even if he is not your state senator, this guy, one of the hardest working state senators you will ever come across here in our state, he represents really all of us fighting the good fight. And by the way, it's an uphill battle when you're trying to protect our freedoms, our liberty, and really our way of life. Let's welcome back State Senator Rob Sampson. Senator, good morning. Good morning, Representative. Thank you for always uh, doing such a tremendous job on the introduction. Uh, you're far too generous. No. And, uh, I do represent the town of Cheshire and also the town of Wilkin. Uh, Wilkin, right. I want to leave them out. That's my hometown. Yeah, well, okay. I'm glad that you corrected me. But, uh, but you're, no, no, no. You gotta, you, I think you misunderstood me, my friend, because I speak of the truth. I, when I say everything that I just said, um, I'm not trying to just be kind. I'm, I, I really do need it, Rob. You are fighting on behalf of all of us. And I know. I know because I've been up there with you, but you have taken it to another level. You're fighting the good fight, not just when we're in session, but you're fighting it 365. And it's not easy. Because especially when you don't feel you have the support, uh, you've got more support than I think you even realize. But it's nonetheless, in the state of Connecticut, it's always going to be an uphill battle, and it shouldn't when it comes to our freedoms. Right. Um, It's unfortunate, and it shouldn't be an uphill battle. Uh, because, as you said, um, you know, there's some momentum uh, that I think is uh, shifting in the state mm-hmm. of Connecticut and maybe across the nation as well. I mean, I think Republicans are poised to do very, very well on a national level. And I may have been even more pessimistic than the average person about our chances to, um, you know, pick up some, uh, you know, constitutional offices or statewide seats or increase our numbers in the House and Senate in Connecticut. But I'm starting to think that uh, we have a real chance mm-hmm. to make a, make a dent in the Democrats' majority. And um, it's been a long time coming. There, there's no question about that because uh, I can't think for the life of me any reason why anyone in any circumstance in this state, and I mean, literally, people are in all different circumstances uh, based on, uh, you know, geography, wealth, uh, you know, um, whatever industry they're in. I, I, I can't think of someone who is really truly better off unless they are in fact part of the government class um, that is better off with the Democrats. <laughs> and uh, the more people do catch on and realize that, uh, you know, they own it all. All of the affordability issues that we have, uh, inflation, uh, our poor economic situation uh, generally, um, which, you know, we're kind of skating through right now because we have this surplus, but that surplus was created by our problems. The surplus was created by uh, the pandemic in combination with, uh, you know, tax hikes and so forth that have ultimately taken more money out of uh, citizens' pockets and putting it into government coffers. Um, and I believe they ought to give that back. Uh, they own all of the crime issues. Uh, you know, I mean, people, I think, are starting to catch on that, uh, you know, 40 years of the Democrats in charge is not the answer. And uh, maybe give the Republicans a shot. 
forgive me, Senator, for asking such a generic question, um, but I have to ask you this because you, I know, are out there every day fighting this battle. When you are speaking with constituents, what's on their mind? What are they telling you? Um, and I ask, first of all, I ask a lot of the candidates this, but I, I'm really particularly curious with your answer um, because I, I, you're such a straight shooter. Uh, you give it to people, the good, the bad, the ugly. Hey, look, people need to know you're very transparent. And I, I, and I get a sense that because you are, people will be so with you in return. So I'm curious to know what, what's on people's minds when you are speaking with uh, uh, this great citizens of our state. So, Gary, I, I have been doing a lot of door knocking and going to events, and uh, I went to a, a ton of fairs and fall festivals over sure. the last couple of weeks. <laughs> so I have talked to a lot of constituents, and I will tell you, you know, the two issues I just mentioned are first and foremost. Um, I think the Democrats uh, have it all wrong. You know, they, they, they're they trying to get people to focus on everything but um, our affordability issue, which is number one in the state. People ultimately are going to vote their pocketbook um, when uh, times are tough. Um, that may be less the case when we're in a roaring economy and things are moving along pretty well, but when people are concerned about their ability to pay for oil for their furnace, uh, you know, or put gas in their car, I, I got to tell you, the pocketbook takes precedent. The one thing I would say that is totally different than in previous uh, cycles is the level of anger. People are truly, passionately angry with their government. And um, I don't know if I, I, I like the notion that they're angry, but I like the reason why they're angry, which is um, they are waking up and they are realizing that the government actually does impact uh, their daily lives. Uh, I think in America, you know, the, the whole concept of America is that the government should be small and staying out of the lives of people. And I think for the most part, we go about our business that way, and that's the way it should be. Uh, but sadly, government does have an impact on what's happening in our lives. And in Connecticut, the Democrat majority, the last two governors in particular, have had a significant negative impact on us. Uh, so if they can continue to talk about abortion and uh, gun control and a lot of side issues. I, you know, i got to tell you, I've talked to hundreds of people just in the past couple of weeks. I, I, I think maybe one person asked my, my stance on, on the uh, Roe v. Wade issue. Yep. Um, almost everyone else is concerned more about whether or not they're going to be able to afford to eat their house. Yeah, it's so funny that you bring that up. Last I knew, um, abortion has been codified in this state already. Gun laws are, we, we've got the second uh, strictest gun laws in the nation, second only to, I believe, Illinois. Um, and how's that going for you, folks? Um, it's really not even, it's a non-issue. But I guess... I look at it like this, Senator, where they can't run on on uh, how our, our, our economy or, or or the safety that we have in our state or the education system that we have in our state. They can't run on that because, like you said, they own it. So they're looking at these other issues that, to you and I, we know that they're actually non-issues, but to the average uninformed voter, who they believe it is. No one's trying to. No one's trying to take their abortions away. You can't. You know the really the elephant in the room is inflation, economy. Um, the, how about the, the safety of of our citizens? Really, if government has a purpose, it's that. You know, uh, it, it's it's the security of keeping its people safe. Um, I, I I don't know. I think that's the reason why they're bringing up these issues is because they can't talk about the economy. Absolutely. Um, they're caught. I mean, there's, there's no other way to put it. I mean, they're caught. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, you know, there's a small portion of the population that is, you know, paying close attention to what's happening day to day in the news cycle, what's happening in our federal and state government. But the majority of people, you know, they catch tidbits here and there. You know, they're, they're, it's in their, uh, you know, their stream on the Internet or it's on their, their, their Yahoo homepage when they log in in the morning to check their email or whatever, or they're catching a little bit on the radio. They're not getting the full news spectrum. And a lot of those people have escaped truly understanding where the political parties stand in Connecticut uh, and, and, and the impact that they have on you know each and uh, every one of us and how we live our lives and what our opportunities are and, and, and things like that. But I think that that's all changing. I think that it is so in your face right now 
that the Democrats are responsible for every last ounce of the problems that we are faced with. Mm-hmm. And uh, the contrast um, between Republican administrations and Democratic administrations in uh, federal office um, over the last several decades uh, has painted a very clear picture. We, we tend to have more freedom and opportunity and a better economy when Republicans are in charge. When the Democrats are in charge, we start to um, go blazing towards socialism, wealth redistribution, the stock market does worse, everybody's economic outlook is worse. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other issues that we really should talk about, too, okay. because I think the Democrats own one other thing that um, people are waking up to that they don't care for, and that is a lot of this woke nonsense. Um, you know, the, the, the infusion of the far left, uh, ideological, uh, you know, view of, of the country that uh, it's a systemically racist country and there's white privilege and we have to teach, um, you know, African American kids in school that they're victims and that uh, white kids are oppressors and all of that stuff has got to stop. I, I don't think anybody likes that. Nobody wants to see that happen. We want American values where people are treated equally and fairly under the law. And uh, none of this identity politics, I, it, it's bad. They use it to divide people and win political elections. And I think people are finally, finally wise to it. Yeah, but it's not just the far left that are, it's, that's keeping wokeism alive. It's the media. It's employers, you know, um, uh, I, there's employers where if you're a white straight male, they don't even want you. I mean, they'll, you, you got to come in. I mean, there's the optics of that. You got there's probably legal reasons why they, you got to come in and, and interview as well. But the chances of you getting hired, slim right. to none. Yeah, Gary, I think a lot of that is fear based. Though, I mean, certainly there is the the far left controls a lot of the uh, uh, delivery of um, public. Uh, thought in this country, uh, they've been smart. You know, uh, the the the, uh, the progressive left has, has done their best to insert themselves in a big way in education, in entertainment, in the news media. So almost everywhere you turn, the, the messaging is coming from them. But I think that when it comes to you know major corporations that have woke uh, policies and they're you know trying to invoke the the DEI uh, in every aspect of how they run their companies instead of actually doing what companies are supposed to do, which is uh, be profitable and create uh, you know products and uh, and and ultimately jobs. Um, you know they're they're in, engaged in all this other nonsense. I think they're doing it out of fear more than anything. I think that these companies are terrified of what can happen if they become a target for the cancel culture mob. And uh, I'm really pleased to see that the American people are, are slowly but surely, I think, turning to reject a lot of this stuff. And uh, more power to them. We know how uh, we know how we became a woke nation from the far left. How do we eliminate it, though? I think that the thing that is lacking uh, generally is a real appreciation for true uh, American history and um, an appreciation for what it means to be an American and the the great fortune of being born as an American citizen. Um, I I think a lot of people, especially young people, don't realize this. You know, if you're you're brought up in a school where they're telling you that your country is a terrible country and that, uh, you know, the founding fathers were nothing but terrible slave owners, which we all recognize. Um, but they also did a lot of good things, too. And not every one of them was pro-slavery. There were a lot of people at the beginning of our country that were working towards ending slavery. And uh, ultimately, we did. Uh, you know, this country uh, deserves credit for, uh, you know, having a civil war where hundreds of thousands of people perished um, over the idea that we were going to finally end slavery. Um, you know, that's, that's omitted from, this, from the history lesson. Uh, there's a, there's a lot of good about America and our place in the world, and uh, people should be very proud and feel very fortunate to live here. And I think if we get back to having some national pride and appreciation for our country, uh, I think so. We'll just we'll just um, automatically better. From your words to God's ears, we're talking with the state senator Rob Sampson. The last time that we were chatting. Um, you had mentioned early voting, and and there's an early mode, uh, an early voting um, amendment uh, referendum, if you will, that's on the November eighth ballot. Right. Um, but have we learned how early this is? It was very ambiguous the last time we chatted about this, which is a while ago. So I'm thinking, did they clear some of this up? What? what how early it has been determined? Uh, just vote no, Gary. That's, that's my <laughs> advice for your listeners. Um, you know, the Democrats, they're very, very clever. 
you know, they come out and they try and convince people, oh, we're all about fairness and we want to provide more access for voting. Well, everybody does. You know, I mean, half of their arguments are ridiculous. Well, we're, we're for the environment and for, um, you know, for education. Who's not for clean environment and for education? I, just, I don't understand. You know, so claiming that you're for those things is just ridiculous. And they, they also say they're for access and voting. Everyone's for access and voting. The thing is that the other side of the equation is you got to have a legitimate, trustworthy election where people can rely on the results and no one is uh, shaking their head after, or as in the 2020 election and the 2016 election, um, you know, either political party is claiming as the other party stole the election. That, that's bad no matter who the winner is. Uh, we've got to get back to elections we can trust. Uh, but in Connecticut, the Democrats have such an extreme majority that they use their position to go ahead and put forward legislation that benefits them. And, um, you know, early voting, they put this on the ballot to make a constitutional change, which to me is a big, big deal. And all it really does is not create early voting. It creates the legislature's ability to determine what early voting can be, which means they can set it for two days or seven days or 30 days or a year if they want. Uh, and that's madness. Uh, people deserve to know what they're voting wow. for. I actually serve on the committee that uh, deals with election law. And when we were debating this, my main issue was if you're going to put a question on the ballot, you have to be honest with the people and tell them exactly what they're voting for. Uh, but they won't do that. I wanted it to say uh, very clearly that we're making a constitutional change to empower the majority of the legislature to determine the number of days of early voting. <laughs> and they don't want to do that. They would rather just be selling free lunch without telling anyone what that free lunch is. Rob, uh, and there's a, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, 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 I don't want to interrupt you. This would be changing the Constitution, though, wouldn't it? Our state constitution? Yes, yes. It will be a constitutional change in yeah. effectively taking out numerous protections that exist in Holy our election yeah. law. Look, for me, elections happen on one day in person, and that we uh, have absentee voting for exceptions. And those exceptions absolutely exist, and we should try and accommodate people that need to. Certainly, people that are in the military or they're sick or they can't make it to the polls for some reason, we do need a way to accommodate them. But we have to do that with security and integrity. The Democrats are abusing that system, too. Um, you know, they changed the law effectively to kind of rewrite what the Constitution actually says about who's eligible for voting by absentee um, to make it not just people who are sick, but anyone who could maybe get sick because there's a sickness in the world. Uh, and they use COVID for that excuse, but they want to extend that even beyond COVID so that everyone is automatically eligible. And when that happens, that means that they have the ability to send ballots to people that they target. So for all of their talk about saying how they want more access for everyone, you don't see the Lamont campaign sending out ballot applications to me or you because they know we're not getting, yeah, they they're not getting our vote. Right. They're sending it to people that they're targeting that they know are going to vote for them. So they're using these things, which they're arguing are for fairness, for their own advantage. And I think it's a pure example of their hypocrisy, and uh, people should notice. It is incredible. All right, I'm running out of time. It, 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 so is early voting, if it gets if it gets voted in, is it in person or is it will it be by that absentee ballot? Early voting is in person in this question, but that is the only question that's answered. Now that would not cost number of money. Days. That would cost yeah, money to keep even, these pollsters there. Yeah, and yeah, it's going to cost a fortune to keep polls open for you know every day. It costs more. Uh, that's going to raise people's property taxes. Uh, there's a lot of negatives. Oh, you know, ballot security. Who's who's watching these polling machines? You know, each night when they uh, when they close up shop, who's who's counting the ballots? Are they counting them each each day? Does someone have that information? There are a lot of unanswered questions that don't uh, appear in that constitutional question to be on the ballot. And if we want to do early voting down the road, maybe there's a chance that, to do a couple of days of early voting. Something might be reasonable, and we can come to a bipartisan right. solution. But this is not it. No, you're right, State Senator Rob Sampson. I always appreciate and value your time with us uh, when you're with us, and I look forward to the next time as well. Hopefully we can do that sooner rather than later. Good luck to you in the election as well. I appreciate all the time that you offer me, Gary, and thank you for doing what you do on the radio every day. It is uh, even more important than uh, you know what uh, one little state senator can No, do. stop it. You have, the, you have no. the ear of, of thousands of people every day, and uh, thank you for promoting our value system and, and trying to save this country. Well, listen, I, I'm, we're just trying to expose the truth, finally. Thanks again. We'll talk to you soon. When we come back, it's open phones.